there's only kind of two ways you can look at this business. You can look at it as mercantile. It's all about the money. It's all about the dollars and cents and mining your P's and Q's. Or it's about community. Okay? Build it and they will come. And that's what it is. I love shopping at the comic book store. There's something about the people who read comics. They seem to have that sort of like um, very open, accepting, nerdy soul. And I just feel like I'm at home when I'm here. You get the personal experience. You get, um, you know, they know what you want. They know what you're in there for. If you go up to the counter and you say, hey, I'm looking for this issue. You know, I have cover A and B. I'm looking for the retailer incentive cover. Do you think there's any way you can find that for me? And usually they're like, I'll see what I can do for you. You know, bookstores are like, well, what is that? There are always things that a person can get for you that a website can't. And if you have that personal touch, you have more knowledge of what's going on, of uh, what is available, and also the service. Because you want a shop that anybody can walk into and feel welcome. So you don't have to feel like, you know, you're, you have to be a comic book fan to walk in this store. You don't, you don't want it to feel like it's somehow a private club. You know, you've got to speak the lingo. Seven days of epic! Epic, 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 epic. All right, here we are at our first destination. We are in Lawrence, Kansas. This is Astro Kitty Comics, which is uh, right on top of a coffee shop, uh, the Java Brig. And uh, Vince, this was the shop that you and I both kind of frequented uh, when we lived here in Lawrence. This is going to be one of the few stores that we've actually both been to. I met my wife through this store. Her best friend was organizing comics, said, hey, you would like this girl. And I said, cool. So I met my wife through this store. So I have a little bit of sentimentality attached to this store. Joe, how you doing, man? Oh, hey, how's it going? Good to see you again, Joe. Yeah, me too. It's been a while. Indeed it has. So how's the comic book business? Booing. Is it? No. All I'm saying is somebody should throw me a bone. Throw, throw me a bone. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Alright. You know, somebody should throw it. It's a bone. The first comic I remember getting was in Hayes, Kansas at a gas station. It was like an amazing Spider-Man with Charles Vest cover. And it had like Hobgoblin holding Spider-Man unconscious form. And there was like flames in the background. It was like painted. It was a painted cover. So 
it really appealed to me, going to a Catholic school and reading comics on the side. There was a little hot stuff, a little devil thrown in there, probably some Catholic rebellion, I don't know. And if you haven't looked up Ambush Bug, you must look up Ambush Bug, because he's the most important comic character in all of creation. I opened Astro Kitty in 2005, and I actually had worked at Mastery Comics, which took over. Um, like, there was, Comic Market was downtown for a really long time under different owners, and these this couple came in from uh, Kansas City, and they had run a shop in a comic, they had run a comic shop in a mall at one point, but uh, Steve, the guy who started Mastery Comics, he... Uh, inherited a beer distributorship, so he didn't really need to run a comic shop after that. But the shop that we started, Mastery Comics, was based on like, uh, we're not gonna have dirty, gross den of, you know, it's not gonna be your Android's dungeon, right? It's not gonna be that. And it's not gonna be these other places that we went to that made us feel unwelcome, and we were gonna cater to demographics that weren't catered to, like families and, and ladies. When you ha get into this conversation with customers, you find that they have this whole different perception of comic shops than they should have, right? And part of breaking that down is having a diversity of, of comic offerings. It's not just being friendly and having a well-lit store and not having posters with boobs on the wall. It's not just that, those are all important. But actually having a selection that, oh, that's the phone, actually having a selection that is like, representative of possible possibilities that are outside of this little box that they thought comics was forever. We don't have a huge overhead compared to some places, but we're small and we're not on a, on a main street. So we do what we can with being one of the best kept secrets in Lawrence at times. I took the customer base that existed from Mass Street Comics and I tried to transfer it here. And we had a really strong magic scene there and we had like really good comic clientele. And luckily, they both followed me over here eventually. I've been doing this for about 10 years, right? And I'm starting to get to a point where I need to do other things with my life. And I don't mean not run a comic shop necessarily, I mean in addition to. I have incorporated the art in different ways in advertising and, and, and helping boost the store by designing logos, designing characters, and doing signage. And that's kind of helped sate my artistic whatever, but I mean, I've always been chomping at the bit to do more. and. I have always had projects going. I have an art blog now that's been really helpful at getting me back to doing stuff. Um, and I'm doing some commission pieces and some, uh, I do some graphic design stuff too, so I'm doing some of that freelance stuff. And I've always done freelance off and on. That said, um, people always ask like, well, where's the Astro Kitty comic? And, you know, I, I don't know where the Astro Kitty comic is. I have story stuff, you know, worked out for it. I just don't know if that's gonna be the one that I, Draw. We do these things called a Super Nerd Night um, that we started at the jackpot and we now do at the bottleneck mostly. It's a way to involve everybody in this big party that happens every other month at a local bar for adults to drink and to play video games and to get custom sketches done and to play board games and card games and occasionally see bands. So, uh, how do you read comic books with, with hands like that? With hands like this? Yeah. How do, you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you even pick them up and turn the page? I lick a finger, like that, flip the page. How do you read comic books? So, your comics are in mint condition, then, are they? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I actually use some for mints. But, uh... Wait, you eat your comic books? You're a comic... Well, what do you do with yours when you're done reading them? And look, you even get... The little skull guy bag. Oh, that's awesome! I get the one you were drawing? That's so cool! Essentially what that is, is um, setting up an in-store subscription for a specific comic or comics. The pull list is the lifeblood of any comic book shop. Um, that is money, that's money you know you sell. You know, you know that that copy of Moon Knight number whatever, you are going to be able to sell it you're going to be able to sell 15 of your 20 copies you ordered. So your risk is reduced. Shops that don't have them are insane. You get a discount. And basically I give a discount to subscribers because it gives me a baseline of what to order. That's the key thing. They're helping us by telling us we want this and we make sure we have that in stock. So yeah, we'll, we'll help them out for helping us. One of the things that killed us were the people who would set up boxes and then not show up. Oh, it was brutal. Brutal. 
those people, there's a special place in hell for people who set up comic hold boxes and then never come back and get their books. Someone comes in and says, I want these comics for this month. If they don't buy every single comic on there and they just decide they don't like one, a lot of retailers get mad at them about it. Me, I don't give a tinker's damn. Okay? It's all about statistical probability. I am not going to lose a $30 sale to make a guy feel bad about a $4 comic. Now, that being said, I want to be clear on something. It's kind of easy for a store of our volume to say, okay, we're in a different situation that way. So I totally understand, you know, people that go the other way. If a guy flakes and doesn't show up for a while, take his books out and put them on the shelf. Which usually causes them to come in almost immediately. As soon as I empty his box, I'm like, hey, I'm here. Just won the lottery. I'm here to buy my books. I'm like, oh, shit, just put them back out. It is 11 o'clock on Monday, and we are on our way right now to Omaha, Nebraska to talk to Dean at Krypton Comics. We have an hour to get there. Brandon, are we gonna make it? We're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Are you Dean? I am Dean. Greetings, Dean. I'm Captain Logan. This is Vince. Captain Logan. Good to meet you, man. <laughs> How you doing? Sound like a radio show. <laughs> Captain <laughs> Logan and Vince in the morning. My grandmother basically started all this, and she used to uh, babysit for some very wealthy kids, so I got all of their 1970s toys and all of their 1970s and 60s comics. She would read to me a lot of the funny books, you know, the, the Daffy Duck, and do the voices. Started doing shows, little tiny mall shows. They were pretty prevalent back in the late 80s, early 90s. I did a show where I made $1,000 in a weekend. And I thought, why am I working for a living when I could be making $1,000 every two days? Well, then the next week I did another show and I did like $75. So a big difference. I'm kind of like, oh, this is why I don't do this for a living. But I did a lot more shows, got a little bit better at it. And as that grew, my collection grew, and I thought, let's stop doing the shows and just have a store. I call it a revolving collection. And some of the stuff in my store I don't care about, some of it I do, you know. Some of it I really miss when I sell it because I was kind of hoping it would stay around forever. Uh, if I were to start taking something home from the store, I would take it all. I pretend like this is my collection and, I'm, and people just get to come in and buy pieces of it. The costs uh, of running a business this size is enormous. It's, it's scary. You know, if I would if I would talk to the dean 20 years ago and said, here's where you're going to be in 20 years, I'd be terrified. I have a higher debt load, <laughs> but I do make a lot more money than I made back then. But I figured it out my first two years in business, I made 50 cents an hour. So I make way more than that now, but I think I'm only up to about three bucks. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of zombies that are fans of particular comic book stores, Vince. <laughs> I always tried to make a really nice, clean store that was well lit, that you could bring your mom into, and she wouldn't be completely creeped out. And I think we've done that fairly well. Um, we specialize in Star Wars toys and superhero toys. And not a lot of other comic book stores do that. That's what she looks like on the box. Turn around. And that's what they made. <laughs> yeah. Nailed it! Uh, we have superhero jewelry. Not many other comic book stores do that. This novelty stuff I see at malls I never see inside comic shops. New comic books have always been the bread and butter. You know, it's in the name of the store. Trade paperbacks after that, probably. Back issues after that. And then probably gaming and then probably toys. The markup, of course, is better on a new comic book. That's that's where a lot of your profit comes from. He opened one at 84th and Center back, I think, in 94, 93, something like that. And uh, I was just scratching around trying to find somebody who was of like mind to me for comic books. 
and also to sell my books. I wanted the stores to sell them, so I went to various stores um, in the area. He was the only one that was, uh, how you say it, friendly to independent comics at the time. Well, I think it's very important to support anybody that is gutsy enough to put out a comic book, you know, to get that that thing out of their head and onto a piece of paper is, is pretty gutsy. They're doing it because they love it. Now, would they like to make money? Oh, yeah, you know, and maybe eventually they will. Then when you call them up and say, wow, you landed that gig drawing Marvel comic whatever, they're still willing to come back to your store because you treated them right. Every third Saturday of the month, they have various artists and painters and writers gather in the next room. A friend of mine and I, we, we were sitting and he wanted a, a place to draw. And I said, well, you might as well draw here, get you out of the house. And he said, all right. Well, then a buddy of his came in and a buddy of his and a buddy of his. So then we kind of met, made it an official monthly thing and we call it the Artist Jam. Dean has been a gem and a yeah. bunch of stones. My whole goal is to get Joe Schmo off his butt, put down his video game controller, and get in here and buy a comic book. You know, um, I try not to advertise just to people that already like comic books. I don't want to necessarily preach to the choir. You could have $20 comics up there and people will buy him because for some reason or other, he's a magnet. He draws these people in with his rhetoric, with his humor. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Ciao. What are you getting, man? I'm getting these. These are from the artists that, uh... Oh, cool. So I want to see how these are. Let's see. Yeah. Are those the issues? Yeah, these are the, the ones that he just dropped off, so... Oh, cool. Thanks again, man. Yep. All right, let's go, guys. Right, careful, guys. I was in the room when Free Comic Book Day was pitched um, at a retailer meeting. And they said, who, who is interested in this? I stood up and raised both my hands. I couldn't, I couldn't stand up tall enough to say, holy crap, we got to do this. They have a crazy day and they have people wrapped around their mall to get in and they bring in like Lou Ferrigno and they bring in these big giant names to do signings and they order tens of thousands of comics. We have a line that goes all the way down past the movie theater and it's like that for about six hours. I mean, it is a party in the store all day long. We give away over 10,000 free comics. It is what you make of it. You know, if you have events here, or if you have creators here, or if you have people in costumes, which we try and do every year, it's cool. And people want free stuff. And I see people that I only see once a year, a free comic book day. And I think initially I was like, thanks a lot, people. But now I'm now I'm happy to see even those people because they come to this shop on free comic book day and they know we're here. And when they're here, they generally buy something. Did you know? that of those comics, they cost the retailer, on the low end, 25 cents a comic book. So it ain't free for us. It's free for the free loaders that come in and pick them up. If you're always just barely getting by to do that, to have the big blowout, you can't. So now it's big shop versus little shop. It was successful when we were giving away beer with a free comic book. <laughs> no, it's not perfect. But it's a, it's a tool that we, it's given to us. We use it however we want to. And how effective a tool that is, is what we do with it. This year we had a tremendous success. We brought an artist in, it, uh, it did great for us. Everyone's better than the last. Hell, the only thing that keeps us from making it even better is we just need more space. After we were out of free comic day books, we just started giving away books. We just went out to 50 cent boxes and brought them in and gave those away. I would like to see some of the quality on a few of the issues be a little higher. A lot of the books that they, they sell us for free comic day are promotional for upcoming things and they sell them to us, to us at a profit. DC did it really well when they launched Blackest Night. Having those books still available for us to get in and sit on the counter and say this is how it starts right here. It had sold like nothing else. So then the industry comes up with another event 
Halloween Comic Fest, it's the same thing as Free Comic Book Day. Are we going to do it up? Are we going to support it? Absolutely. We love it. But it's the same thing. It's the publishers putting out cheaper comics for us to buy and then give away. We need other fresh ideas. And sadly, I don't have them. I'll tell you a great free comic book story, right? The line went out the building down all the way past Arby's. So I thought, well, I'm going to do something for the people that are waiting in line. So I had ordered a bunch of Green Lantern rings to give away all the colors, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm giving them away, and I come across this older couple. And I said, would you like a Green Lantern ring? And he says, sure. What's that? And I said, well, it's the, you know, ring of the Green Lantern and blah, blah, blah. Well, cool. That sounds good. And I go, all right. What are you two doing in line? And he said, well... Me and the missus were driving down Snelling Avenue, saw a line and thought, by God, we better get in that line to see what's going on, right? And he says, so what is this line for? And I said, free comic books, dude. Really? That's awesome. Dan, are you ready for six more days of this? Yeah. Yeah, are you stoked? Yeah. You look excited. You look like you're bouncing off the walls, man. I, I think so. That was crazy. That? It's the full moon all the time. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Good morning, how you doing? Really, really good. Good to see you here. This is Fran. Fran. Good to meet you. It's using all of its space to its advantage. That's, That's hilarious. hilarious. I mean, I was definitely probably six or seven, and um, my mom bought at a garage sale a couple of really big bags full of comics, no covers on them at all. Um, Legion of the Superhero, Superboy, that kind of stuff. And it would be our treat whenever we'd go on a road trip. She'd bring out the bag of comics, and we could read them while we're driving. I actually got into the industry by answering an ad for an assistant manager of a bookstore. Did not get the job, and, and the guy even told me at the time, he's like, we loved your personality, we want your personality, but you don't know anything, so you're not getting the job. Well, the guy he hired that had all the knowledge didn't work out, so I literally got a phone call about a month later that said, well, we tried the knowledge, the knowledge didn't work, so we're going to try the personality and see if we can get you the knowledge. And so he was still finishing up college and he would be studying his college studies and I would come home with stacks of comic books. That, it, that was my homework. The first one I fell in love with was the Kamika Brothers Grindel. She told me that the only way she'd marry me is if that someday when she came to Sioux City she'd be able to open the store. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, okay, whatever, that's not going to happen, but okay, that's fine. So we, she started buying collections and buying more collections and buying more collections and next thing we knew our house was completely filled with back issues probably you know 50 60 boxes of back issues I'm like well i guess it's time to um open a store then in the 90s stores were opening and closing left and right and when we talked to people about opening a store we, we talked to her old boss and things like that and they said don't do it you are getting in the worst possible time. We decided to go with a little bit different concept. We went with a nice, clean-looking store. We didn't go with the, the older dungeon stores that, you know, you walked into, you were really scared to go into, and you couldn't talk to the guy behind the counter because he's sitting back up there reading a book and could care less to talk to you. We didn't want that. We actually flew an actor out of New York for Marvel to do Spider-Man for our first opening. And I was sure that we wasted all this money bringing this guy in and we wouldn't have a single person in the place. So I'm calling the night before all my friends up going, please come, please come. That way we have at least somebody here. And we turned around and we had taken him to the hospitals first and then we showed up at the store and there was a line at the door waiting for us to unlock and open. At the end of the day, I looked at him and said, you're in charge. <laughs> when it comes to promotions, you can do whatever you want to from here on out. In a month of us opening, we were already doing a three-year-old business level without having the three years to grow into the business level. So I was on the phone ordering 
all the time trying just to get the stock up and to get the stuff back in for people because as fast as we were getting stuff in we were sending it out the door I mean it just it was insane the store is owned by her there you don't see a lot of female comic book store owners out there and we have a lot of female customers coming in as you can tell this morning most of the people who came in are girls and we do have a lot of girls in the industry and that's it's kind of cool that they can feel comfortable coming into our store and not feel ostracized or feel bad because they like comics and that's a boys thing. She's the first first female business owner to win the Eisner Award. Second place award, 2003 second place award. In 2002 out of 700 points we missed it by six points. 2003 out of the same amount of points we missed it by one point from getting the winner. That's our winner right there. That's the 2004. We were the last per people to be given to by Will Eisner himself. We have a brick and mortar and then we attend close to 40 conventions a year. Ooh, so we're wow. not used to sitting down. We do as much money on the show circuit now as what we do in brick and mortar. They are brutal. They are very, very brutal because you need to get in, get set up, and uh, we cram as much as we can into to a location. Then you're on your feet the whole time. Again, I'm not the type of person I'm not going to sit behind with the and have you bring the money to me with the product. I, I'm going to be in your face. We're going to talk to you about what you're looking at and, and why you're looking at this and, and have a good time with it. And that, you know, after you get done at 8, 9 o'clock at night, yeah, it's, it gets to be kind of rough. And you then, go out to food and you die in the hotel room. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you then do it all the next day. I take the Doctor Who section. First thing I ask, who's your doctor? You know what? My screwdrivers may be a little bit more than somebody else's. You know, if they're doing at a, you know, we down in Dallas, they had them. There uh, is a mass, mass market, market person clearancing out all their stuff from Christmas. And we were laughing so hard. <laughs> yeah, and and I still, I guarantee you, we sold more than they did because I knew about it. And, and we sold did. out. Yeah, we sold out. It, it <laughs> we we still. That's the other problem with the shows right now is we're getting to the level now. The problem is getting the staff there and getting enough merchandise there. It's really awesome because I've gotten to meet lots of people like William Shatner, Adam West, Peter Mayhew, Daniel Logan, which Daniel Logan and Peter have both been here. We did the Star Wars events, mm -hmm. and the first one we did was Peter and Angie. So we had Peter Mayhew here, and Peter and Angie have become really good friends. Yeah. Well, our vacation one year was we were doing Star Wars Celebration, and I had forgotten our wedding anniversary. Not only was it our wedding anniversary, I forgot our 20th wedding anniversary. I was walk given away by Chewbacca, so I was walked down the aisle of the Millennium Falcon to be married by Elvis. So without further ado, let me introduce to you the recommitment of Kevin and Frank. You may kiss him if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really get to have all my friends over uh, whenever I want. That's pretty much like the one problem I have. But he's Chewbacca knows him by name. Uh, Adam West had him up on stage. I mean, it, the the things that he's gotten to do that the general public would never get to do. I'm like, honey, it's a trade off. <laughs> Ta -da. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Did you think of that? <laughs> Adios. <laughs> My attitude, which thankfully the industry is starting to jump on the bandwagon again with, is you got to get them reading when they're kids because where do you think in 10 years or 20 years the comic readers are going to come from? If you haven't gotten them out of the video games, <laughs> what makes you think they're suddenly going to go, oh, we got to go into a comic store? Most of the kids I talk to don't like to read. And if you don't know how to read, and if you don't like to read, then you're a victim of anything that happens to you. If you don't get the kids to read comics, at a certain point, all the people who are reading comics right now are gonna all die off. And then if nobody else is getting into it, then you know what's gonna happen to the industry. I think it's difficult to get a teenager into comic books. Uh, I think you can get a young kid. Um, and then I think you have to get past that cars and girls stage for, for guys. My favorite version is when somebody has a subscription of Pull and Hold and then their kid starts getting stuff with them or through through them. They come in together and that's kind of fun. You know, I hear all this, this, oh, you know, we 
gotta get kids and blah 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 and kids comics and kids this and kids that. Eh, wrong. Eh, wrong. Hit the wrong button. Eh, again. Because they don't get it. You have to get their mothers. Mom decides whether Junior Samples gets to go into that store. Is it clean? Is it safe? Are the employees nice? I've seen people where, you know, they come in and, you know, they got a 10 year old kid with them and they're buying Walking Dead comics for them. You know, and of course I tell them, you know, I said, this is, you know, this is for a mature audience. You know, it's, they go, oh, no, that's okay. He watches at home, you know, so. I will fight tooth and nail not to sell Walking Dead to a minor. I, I don't think it's appropriate for kids. I let my child watch the TV show. I still won't let him read the book, simply because I know what's going on in the book, and the book is much more intense. He might be old enough to know that he could handle it. I don't want to know that he's old enough to handle it. I, I think one of the things early on, at least to a young person, is their morality tales and the good guys win. And when you're a kid, that's an important thing. You know, you want to you wanna believe that you know, the righteous prevail. These are superhero soap operas. They're made for older readers. You've got issues that a kid will never understand. You know, you've got relationship issues. You've got dealing with identity issues. A lot of kids just want to read the crazy stuff that's on the stands over here, because once they hear it's for kids, it's like, I don't want to read that. Um, not all of them are like that, but uh, quite a few of them have that attitude. And so then it becomes weird for me, because Sometimes the adults that have brought him in, brought them in here don't have a concept that mainstream superhero comics aren't for kids these days. And I'm not saying they should be, but that's just the way it is. We know 15-year-old kids going to read a Marvel or DC book and be shocked. So I, I guess these are all in the middle, I think. And what there needs to be more is way more really cool kid books. And I try and get every kid book that comes out that looks like it's worth a crap, but there's not enough of them. Do they sell? They do so, and they need to make way more. They don't do enough of kid superhero books. There's kid stuff based on licenses. Hell, I like a lot of the kid books better because they're all one and done. I don't have to remember for a month what's going on. You read it, it's a cool story. Those guys doing those books actually know how to write comic books. A lot of these guys know how to write graphic novels. They need to create new and interesting content that appeals to both kids and also can, just like classic cartoons, also appeal to adults. Kids also buy everything. They want a candy bar, they want a rubber ball, they want a gotcha from the gotcha machine, they want an Archie comic, a Sonic comic, regular show comic, and then they want one of those little plush figures. And maybe a movie. So uh, Roseville is our next city, and uh, we're gonna do the source tomorrow. And so uh, we gotta drive in the rain. It's all stormy and crazy. Ah! Man, we got in the car just in time. Will we make it out of here alive? <laughs> Luckily, we were able to slow down in time, but we're just driving along. And, oh crap! Look, it's the roads closed. Hey guys. Dominic. How you doing? How are you, sir? Good. Welcome to the SARS. Right. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming. Wow. Thank you, sir. Sure. Yeah. This is enormous, man. Oh, thanks. Good lord. Okay, okay. So square footage. 13,870. 13,000. Yeah. Yesterday we went to um, Acme Comics and Sue Sue. Oh, yeah. And that was a lot nice of fun. Place. That was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. And then the day before we went, we went and saw Dean at Gridlock Comics. Oh, you got good choices. I just love going to a new town. Oh, good. There's a comic store there. You know? Who knows what treasures you might find, right? I was at a store in Las Vegas a couple years ago. Absolutely plain Jane store. But the guy got to spend a week with Jack Kirby. And I was like, oh, good. There's nobody here. Can you tell me about it? Tell me what he was like. And he did. The treasure in that store was the clerk. All right, Bernie. You ready for the tour? Sure. Apparently we have the largest comic, longest comic book uh, wall in ever. I've never like seen it. anything like this. <laughs> I didn't think I would say this walking into a, a comic store, but this has got to be the most extensive gaming place I've even ever seen. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, wow. It's 40% bigger than our older store, and we have the same amount of product. Flapjacks and Sasquatches. We just had the world championship here last Saturday. <laughs> where we, we cooked um, flapjacks and bacon on the grill, and it was and just fed everybody. 
they have come out with sleeves for for the card sleeves, so the card sleeves don't take damage. I know it's crazy, and people are what? buying them. Yes, damage. isn't that like a pocket protector protector? Yes. Yeah, I'm surprised to see as much books books. Yeah. And we, you know what? Since we moved across the street from Barnes and Noble, we sell more than we did down the street, which is really? very odd. Yeah, that is weird. But there's a lot of people who want to support local businesses. Folks, if you didn't think that role playing was a big industry, we're, pro we're proving that <laughs> wrong. We had a, a parent come in. Do you have swords? You know the sharp ones, like the kids like, which which is a quote we we often say to each other and laugh because it's so ridiculous. And Iron Man, you know. Because Tony Stark has a big ego. <laughs> he has to be He's got to be biggest the biggest. One. Ice cream. Wow. Which goes really well. And then candy. Thank you. Thank you, man. You're welcome. It was great. I was in River Falls at the time. My father was a teacher at UWRF. And I went grocery shopping with my mom. And, of course, I got tired of looking at the celery department. So I wandered off to a newsstand. And there was a book there that was a reprint of The Wedding of the Fantastic Four which was absolutely the best possible hook book to get somebody in, involved in comics. Because not only did it have the Fantastic Four, it had cameos by just about all of the Marvel Universe. And it was just like this whole world that I never knew existed. And I've been collecting comics ever since. I was pretty complete on probably 1959 to 1985 on both Marvel and DC. And... Uh, but I can't, I can't give up my darlings. <laughs> it's really unlike any other form of, of entertainment in that it's, it's not a movie because it doesn't spell it all out for you. And it's not a book because it doesn't leave it all to your imagination. It's somewhere in between. I used to shop at the source way back in the day. And I found myself more and more, I've always been a fan of like business and business systems, how they work and you know kind of the dynamics of retail and it's one of those be careful what you wish for because I kept complaining 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 and finally they said they had enough of me they said you think you can do better and I said oh hell yeah brother I know I can do better and they said bring it on and that's how I got involved at the same time I had a young son born and I decided that Rather than being trapped in kind of the corporate world, I want to go to a soccer game. This has been here since I was a kid, so I just come here because it's kind of what I grew up with, and it seems a lot more homely here. And they help you out, and they have a very big selection of pretty much anything you'd need yeah. here. Comic I've books, been to a like couple, books. yeah, different ones, and this is definitely the biggest selection around. We've always been told that the it's impossible to successfully combine gaming and you know comics and gaming and look at mayhem us some of the biggest stores in the country are this exact kind of combination of comic books media and gaming stuff you know what mcdonald's happiest day in mcdonald's roseville minnesota was the day the source moved next door oh my oh i bet god <laughs> free comic book day we totally took over their parking lot and all that the manager comes over and i'm like oh Thanks. So, really? And she goes, yeah. I think we should have free comic book every day. And this is mine. She goes, my registers have been overrun all day. So like, yep, the comic guys like that McDonald's. I get asked the magic bullet question all the time. I also get accused of, well, the source is lucky. The source did this. The source just happened to be at the right place. The source this, the source that. First off, there is no magic bullet. I think fundamentally in the world of comic books and entertainment, we are not selling bread nor gasoline. Your world will not go to pieces if all of this disappeared tomorrow. We try to make our experience personal because this is the, the way they have chosen to spend their entertainment dollars. Do you know how many times I get told, hey, you know this new Batman Superman DVD? I'm buying it from you guys. It's $3 cheaper across the street at Target but I like you guys. I shop at the source because I walk in the door and um, and the guys know my face and they know my favorites and they're like, without, I mean, I'll walk in the door and they'll say, hey, did you know we got some new Wonder Woman magnets this week? Hey, did you know there's a new statue on the shelves? Um, or, you know, they'll, they'll tease me about my, you know, 
little baby Loki obsession, which has more to do with Tom Hiddleston, I'm not gonna lie, than it does with Loki. Come in, you're kind of dragging in the morning and somebody comes in and says, where is it? And I'm like, what? And they're like, the new issue of X-Men, dude, where is it? And I said, it's right over there. Awesome, you know, and it gets people all excited. They, they like, supplant us with nuclear energy. We're very supportive of our alt and indie community. We carry all their stuff. We've never said no. You know, to have them see them the first time they sell a piece of their work to someone where they've taken something that their mind, they pulled out of whole cloth through their mind and put down on paper to sell it, it's, it's like watching the birth of a baby. I think the biggest celebrity thing ever for me was when we won the Eisner Award. All the guys here were having a party back at the store, you know, that we'd been nominated. I called them and uh, they said, guys, I got bad news. And they're like, oh, well, don't worry. It's, you know, it's okay. You got now, right? I give the phone to Will and he goes, boys, this is Will Eisner. You guys won the award. And he's holding the phone, right? And I can hear the explosion. What? A Watchman toast. Okay, I have to have that. Squid, nuke, fun like this. Fun like this. <laughs> it's been a really enjoyable experience. You know, I uh, personally, it, it's it's very gratifying. But I I know how lucky I am that I get to do something I love. You know, and that's a rare thing. And when you talk to Dean. Tell him I want that five bucks he owes me. <laughs> really? He owes you five bucks? No, but tell him I told you that. <laughs> Thanks again, guys. See you guys. We'll see you again. Too expensive relative to what? Too expensive to the $12 movie. Too expensive relative to the three sixty one a gallon of gas. Yeah, you know what? Comic books were 20 cents when I was growing up. So what? Gas was 58 cents a gallon. What's the point? Believe me, the consuming world will let us know when they think they're too expensive. Although expensive, you know, it's a relatively cheap form of entertainment. I'd rather be paying the same price that I, that I could have been paying when I was younger. Because I love them so much, I will pay the price. I don't think they're too expensive now. They're reasonable. I, I, you get a lot of art for four bucks. You have to look at the work that goes into these things. So I, I do not think comic books are expensive at all. Uh, adding extra stories of characters that aren't the character that you bought the book of, adding digital print codes, anything that's not the story of the book that increases the price, I, it should not be added, I, I don't think. I hated Marvel for a while because a long time they were doing um, twice a month shipments on some of their books. And it felt like I was getting half the story in each of those things and those two comics together is a whole story and I'm paying $3.99 for both of those books. When I was a kid they were about a buck twenty-five and good lord if they were that price still I would buy everything on the shelf. We expect higher quality because it's a higher price. You want the best books? You want the best creators, right? On those books. So you have to pay these people a living wage. But with that comes a four dollar comic book. Whenever a guy comes in and is like, man, I don't know, my wife's not gonna, 50 bucks, my wife's gonna be pissed, I will just tell it like this. I was on my way to a strip club, and I saw a comic shop, and I went there and got comics instead. It was 50 bucks. She'd be like, good decision. $2.99 keeps it good. $3.99, people are still in. I think once you jump up to $4.99, it's gonna really hurt a lot. DC had the right idea there for a while, you know, drawing the line at $2.99. I mean, I know a lot of people who have dropped comics specifically for that reason because, you know, three ninety nine, you know, four dollars for, you know, five ten minutes of enjoyment seems high for some people. They're not until I see a little kid buy one. When a little kid has like a five dollar bill and buys a comic, it's kind of a bummer to me. So I wish that there were cheaper options for kids. I would say there needs to be less ads though. If you're gonna pay four or five six dollars for a comic, there shouldn't be any ads. I think it's a problem with those people that are delusional that there is a like vast unserved community of wannabe comic readers that if only we could tear down every barrier between them and comics they'd come rushing in to give us their money. 
There's not that many barriers. Find a shop, give them your money, you can have a comic book. What do you gotta like? Well, it's, it's 25 cents, I wrap it in a blanket, I take it to your house, I give you a bottle, I read it to you, then I tuck you in bed. I mean, you don't have to kiss everyone's ass. It's three bucks. If you can't afford three bucks, what are you wasting your time reading comic books? Go back to school, get a better job. It's three bucks. The best deal is we get to vote every Wednesday. It might be the most democratic business in the world, comic books. <laughs> so what do you guys think of my airplane? I wish it went faster, but you know, otherwise. Okay, yeah, I think it flies pretty low to the ground. Oh my god, windmill! We went to the source yesterday. I hear very good things about that one. It was all kinds it of fun. Really Could ever get out of my six foot by six foot square? I would love to go there. So this goes without saying, but if you had this in where you live, you you this would be where you go, right? To yeah, get your hair. Okay. I, I would totally like, go here and get my hair cut. I would I would go here, get my hair cut, get my bowl every week. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't get my hair cut every week because I didn't grow that fast. Do you consider yourself more of a salon or a barber shop? Uh. Kind of both. We've got both both licenses working in here. So I'm a barber, and then my coworker, who is also my mom, who talked me into this after I got out of the military and moved around 18 years ago. I was like, I don't know what I want to do. Just like go to barber college and figure out what you want to do with life. So my 18th year this September, I'm like, wow, I guess I'm gonna cut hair and sell comics. I was having my third kid, and I was like, I'm a kid up in the town I grew up in. So what can I do to help pay rent? I put up that one wall, which is now our marble wall, and it's expanded to all this, and I'm not done yet. We haven't done walk-ins for over a decade because being here in Cedar Falls, we built up a really strong clientele. We didn't, you only got in with us if you knew us. So, or, you know, had somebody who's here, we did. Every place is like, uh country and sports and this place is comics and rock yeah it's just an entirely different kind of atmosphere than you'd ever have in any other barber shop and any other comic book store just because it yeah. has that also right and you know what's really cool about this place it smells like a salon it smells nice in here <laughs> did you open this without comics yes okay and how it's long did you do that before you finally started adding this 10 stuff? years i was okay. on the hill cutting hair for 10 years before I started adding stuff. And we were in this building since 99. Let's do this, don't make me look like a asshole. I, I won't. Because that's going to be hard. Only, I am the only you can do that. The comics, they've been just a part of my life as long as I can remember. So, and then I saw Star Wars when I was two. I'm a Star Wars addict. I did name my son Tarkin, all right? I am just that big a Star Wars addict. Our last name is Rogers. Comes out one day, he goes, so, Daddy, Star Wars is your thing, comics are my thing. And he's like three and a half. He goes, why didn't you name me Steve? I actually served on board the USS Enterprise as an operations specialist in the 90s. That was quite cool, get on the same ship my father served on in the 60s. It's the USS Enterprise, so I've got that under my belt. At any point you were on that ship, did you ever feel the need to say, I'm giving it all she's got? Actually, no, I never did. I shut up. I get here, I drink two rock stars, I time travel to the end of the day. Well, this place is run totally like Cheers. You do feel like when you walk in, everyone does know your name. And it's almost like when I go in and said, Norm, it's Mike, you know. And it's not even necessarily knowing you on a first name basis. I mean, that's nice, but he behaves as if he, as if he does, even if he didn't remember my name. You know, um, he behaves as if he knows me. This is by far the most unique setup I have ever seen. I don't know any other comic book shop, barber shop in the country that does this. I needed something fun to do, so the comics I put in here for my fun. That's why I can do all the deals that I do and everything. I've got the whole overflow from the comics on top of my regular clientele, who are also comic fans, so it's crossed, just huge. So now I do all of their hair. The store is an evil, evil thing for me. Because I'll leave here at night and I'll walk past something and be like, 
I don't own that. Technically, I paid for that. And then next thing I know, it's in my collection. We have a huge uh, female clientele because of the hair salon and because of our personality and our location. It's just like we have just so much diversity in this store and it's different than any other store I've ever been in. We're right here next to the college. Um, so we cater to the college and above. And the college students, they don't always watch what they say. So we, tr we try and tone that down for the kids. But for the younger ones, they're always welcome here. But really, our business is built for college and above. We generally try to keep between six and eight to ten of the newest issues on the wall, and because those are the what people are interested in. If if they want to go for say 70s X-Men, there are some fantastic X-Men trades that you can pick up. As Rob mentioned, we are a college town. I don't know of many college kids that could drop. I don't even know what the price of say Days of Future Past. X-Men book issue would be. Rod, Rod here is uh, giving us these exclusive variants. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, buddy, no problem. <laughs> Spider-Man saved my store. It's on the cover of the issue. <laughs> this is where it's happening. All right, guys. Have a great day. Oh, bye, bye, guys. Enjoy you. Yes, Thank you. Enjoy well done, guys. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah, we have, have a safe we have fun. Games. I don't ever really see the people going to see a movie and then wanting to get into comics. Like, oh my god, our comic collectors with the movies get interested in more stuff. People expanding out from what they normally would read because of the movies. When we first opened, uh, Batman with Michael Keaton affected everybody. Batman comic books skyrocketed, Detective 27 went through the roof. It did an incredible awareness for comic books. The next few movies after that, not so much. The first Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Quite a few people, but the second and the third, nope. This new Spider-Man movie, nope. No one goes to Spider-Man movies like, this is based on a comic book? I should go see about that. But the Avengers maybe got some kids. Movies like Watchmen, uh, V from Vendetta, Sin City. It's because nobody knows anything about these movies. So they see Sin City and they go, Oh, that was pretty neat. Let's go find something out about that. We were selling 10 Watchmen graphic novels a day because of that trailer. Like, I, I'm not exaggerating. We sold hundreds of copies of Watchmen. And that's a book that was 20 years old. Tons of people wanted to come in and read the Men in Black comic book. But it wasn't available. You couldn't sell it to them. There's nothing else the TV shows. Walking Dead. My God, I mean, that's... Every time we think we have all of the people in Sioux City covered with Walking Dead, we'll still get new people in the door with a, uh oh, I need to read this. I didn't We're like, myself a comic. how did we not get you yet? We have people come in and buy number ones of the new image book simply because that book might get sold to Hollywood in the next three years. I'll tell you, more, even more telling than the movies is news, news reports. I had a guy, I had like several old, older dudes come in that were saddened. <laughs> by the loss of Captain America. And they bought their pivotal issue, you know? And then I never saw them again. This is what people think of when they think of Iowa, they think of the Midwest. It's really, it's really cool. I mean, this is just quintessential. One of the big themes that we're noticing among the stores that we've been visiting is that uh, community is entirely important. And uh, by the end of Field of Dreams, people are flocking to this thing uh, because we have such a strong community connection now. People from all over are coming in and they're yeah, meeting each other. And people will mingling. come. And uh, so this is what we're really getting. Uh, uh, like the heart of the comic book trade is community. So, uh, you know, we might as well come to some place that kind of embodies that. One really cool event we had, um, the year we won the Eisner, is right when Batman came out. Oh, yes. And uh, we <laughs> actually got to have the suit in the store. And Three weeks after the movie. Right after the movie came out. And we the, talk about it begins? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and the, there is only one person allowed to wear the suit. And um, we flew him in from LA. There was this mom came to us just frantic. And with the, hey, my son isn't bound to a wheelchair. He's got brittle bone disease. He can't be out in public. Is there any way he can just see him? Just take a peek and just see Batman. And so I went and I talked to him, and he uh, said, "No, we're going to do better than that." 
So he got the suit on and he came out and we had the little boy like right over in this section here, kind of away from the line. And he got down on his, you know, crossed down with the kid and he did the, all right, I want you to do your exercises every day. Drink your milk. Drink your milk, do whatever you gotta do, you're gonna be my new Robin. And we were all just like, oh, we're bawling. We're like, oh, my <laughs> yeah, God, this is so sad. But it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I mean, this guy really, really... He was incredible. I'll show you the power of a community. Um, one of our long-term... Everybody knew this guy. His name nickname was Roadkill. Big hulking brute of a man. Dragon tattoos. and Positively frightening and positively the nicest human being you've ever met. He was in comics, science fiction. I mean, everybody knew him. He was the guy you needed a hand, he'd be there to show up and help you. He uh, was working for a food distributor, passes out one day. They take him to the hospital, and he's a walking dead man. He's got this horrific, horrific brain tumor. I mean, where they, they just... There's not much they can do. And uh, we were just crushed. I mean, it's roadkill. The hell do you mean he's sick? He's Superman. And he says, uh, he said, what can we do for you? You know, all you guys, uh, what can we do for you? I want to go to Disney World. No problem. That's where he proposed to his wife. I get emotional about this. Um, so, we sent out the call. Took us four days to raise the money. $9,000 for the creme de la creme. That's community. First guy coming in the door, a Reformed Southern Baptist minister friend of ours. The most right-wing conservative, you boys is burning in hell, no matter what goes on, but I love you to death. Comes in and pulls out his wallet, and he goes through 85 secret pockets to get to that $100 bill. He's got snaked away that almost breaks in half. It's been in his wallet so long to throw it in the bucket. I said, I said, really? I said, Michael, you don't, you know, Michael doesn't have any money. He's a pastor of a, you know, a small independent church. And I said, you don't have that kind of money. And he says, if he's important to you, he's important to me. What the hell, right? I mean, the problem with that is, that situation is, I don't even know how to say thanks. What, you know, I mean, they, they had a fabulous time, and it was an amazing... I couldn't have been prouder. You know what I'm saying? Hey guys, Rob, how are you, man? Pretty good. Nice to meet you guys. Good to meet you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. And, uh, this, then is this is Dan. Dan and Brandon. This is I'm Dan Brandon. And Sorry, you picked a hot day. Our air conditioning's out, so they're trying to no. fix it today. <laughs> I was at a drugstore with my parents, and I must have been six years old, maybe five years old, and it was issue 244 of Superman. And I remember that one because of the cover. The cover struck me and I, I thought, well, this is really cool. And I knew who Superman was from the cartoons on television. So my mom and dad bought my first book and I fell in love. What a beautiful, appropriate space for a comic book store, especially Thanks. to start out in. I mean, Thanks, yeah, this is the original spot. We came yeah. here back in 1990 and it was just this side. We thought, well, you know, everyone's told us there's no way a comic store is going to survive in this town. It never has. And I think the oldest one to date was like three years old. <laughs> so we said, well, you know, we're stupid, we're young, we're out of college, we'll do it, see what we can do. And 25 years later, I think we proved them wrong. When I graduated, um, I was looking for a job, and the shop that was here before us was looking for someone to work, and I applied and got it. 
in two in two to three weeks, I was his manager, and uh, I realized very quickly this man was not in it for what he should be in it for. He wanted to leave. We had opportunities, and those opportunities popped up. Do you think it helped that there's a college right there? It's yeah. this is the key to the success of this store. It's amazing. We keep growing and we keep running out of room. Uh, the Des Moines store is starting to get growing pains too, and it's about almost the same size. When you have an incredibly ironic name, yeah, because your place is called Mayhem, but it, it is not that. It is. It's true. The, the name does not fit. But when we first started, the feeling did. It was very chaotic. It was like pretend. It's like when you're a kid and you want to pretend to sell snow cones or something. It's like a pretend store. But as you get into it and you do it over the next couple of years, you start to realize, wow, I, I didn't think I was going to keep doing this. But after a couple of years of this, I went, this is pretty cool. We're making money. Let's keep this up. And we kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and opening the second store was one of the biggest uh, plateaus. Um, it, we never thought we'd get there, but once we did that, we said, well, let's see what else we can do. Back in 94, we took the plunge and went to an old uh, uh, distribution center out of Chicago called Windmill Hobbies. They've now since gone defunct. And we filled 15 shopping carts full of games. Well, we dropped $10,000, which was pretty much everything we had in savings to do this, and we put it in the store on the other side. And it was a huge, tremendous success. In fact, it was as big as our comic book side. Anytime you attempt any of this stuff, if you don't go all or nothing, you're pretty much not going to make it. Do you feel the same way about comics? I do. We met in the comic book store, actually. I moved up here um, to go to school over at the university across the street, and I was coming in here picking up my books, and we get to talking a lot, and that's eventually how we had started dating and got married, and now we have our first child on the way. He's always come through for me when I wanted something special, and uh, never been disappointed. The more we got in, the more people would come out of woodwork that would never, like, come in here and they go, I've never been in this store before. I mean, I should have that put on a t-shirt and give it out for free. Now you have been on the back. No, you know, 22 year old college girl's gonna wanna come in a place where she has to like bump elbows with these big, tall, burly guys that maybe are a little bit too on the rank side or something. We don't. We want to get away from that. You have to think about stuff like that when you run a comic book. You do. You, you do. do. You know. You're, you're really it sucks. There. Some of the stereotypes are still there. You know. They are, and unfortunately, you know, they're they're. It's getting better, yeah. and it is changing. But it's still. It's it's more acceptable now. Product's great. You got to have the product. You got to sell it. Making money is terrific. But really, the look of the store is what really counts to that mom who brings her little six-year-old in for the first time. It goes out and tells the PTA, yeah, that was a really clean store, and they're very helpful and nice, and it's bright. It's not all way to think of, like on The Simpsons. We will actually point customers in the direction of going to the library to check out a book to see if they like a series, and then, sure enough, they'll read it, they'll like it, they'll come back here, and they'll start pulling that series or buying that trade for themselves because they've read it, now they have to have it. They do uh, comic book events over at the library. They recently had a Walking Dead day. A lot of shops are starting to get rid of their back issues, which... Really We're seeing that. It scares me. Uh, I know digital is a big thing, but fan base still wants to collect comic books. And if you, you don't, got your collectors. You not got to. You got to. This is this is one of the most neglected areas in any comic book store. Is your back issue area, and I think covers are very important. In fact, if you can't see covers, you can't sell books. The kids section is going to just explode down here. So this is going to mostly be kids down here. Oh, oh kids that, that is cool. We we think that's the best way to treat this room, and the kids love it. We've had more kids come in and read comics lately. We're really going to try to make it a friendly thing that families know when they come down here. There's no danger. You don't have to worry about picking up a, a Vertigo book. But this is another part of our store. Wow, this is back, Amy. Nobody sees. This is our mail order room. We've been doing mail order probably for about 20, 22 years. Um, every week, Dave basically has these final customers, and he sends out the books to them via the U.S. Postal Service. It goes out uh, priority mail and they get their books within two to three days. Now, this is where you take a nap, right? I have, actually. <laughs> yeah. Once we're done with the construction in Des Moines, we touch up the AIM store. The third store is the next project. Wow. All right, well, thanks, folks. Thanks, guys. Have a safe trip, guys. Have Bye. a great evening, Bye. Guys. Did we get everything? Have fun storming the castle. I, <laughs> I would have to say right now, Himmage, uh, although IDW comes really close, um, I love IDW's risk-taking on some of their books, and I love how eclectic they are all the way through. Image produces a lot of uh, creator-owned stuff that has a high impact value to it. Image has some of the most popular, fast-selling out titles. They've got the Walking Dead stuff. Walking Dead actually has been the big 
thing that's drawn a lot of people into comics. You know, you think it'd be the movies. Walking Dead TV series has increased sales of the Walking Dead series in here exponentially. But all those image, you know, sex criminals and all these great books, you can just say, man, that book's really good. And that first volume of the trade, 10 bucks. It just gets people on right away. You get the first five, six issues, 10 bucks, done. I look at Dark Horse and Image, and I would say if you can combine the two, you'd have what I consider the perfect way to produce comics that people can enjoy. And that would be the creator-owned, um, high-level quality stuff that the majority of Image is, um, mixed with the way that Dark Horse approaches packaging them, which is like four to six issue minis. They've got creators wanting to publish with them, and the best creators wanting to publish with them. Um, I would also say Boom is doing some crazy good stuff, and now they have Paul Levitz. Well, hey, when did DC publish their best stuff? Under Paul Levitz. Marvel and DC did. Made some tactical errors recently with some of their talent. Extending contracts or not extending contracts. And so a lot of these folks decided to uncork these ideas they had kicking around in their head instead of turning the ownership over to other companies. Image went and uh, Eric Stevenson, who's the publisher, was like, Hells yeah, we're on that. Truthfully, the name on the book, as far as the company name now, doesn't sell the book. It really doesn't. I'd probably say Dynamite. People know these titles, but they haven't seen anything published with that, you know, Shadow, um, that kind of stuff. Marvel is doing a really good job of getting word out to the everyman that their, their events are going on. You know, the death of this character, Spider-Man is, is now Dr. Octopus, you know. Joe Schmo out there is finding out about that. Obscure reference time. All right. <laughs> Zebra Batman, tell your friends. Mm. Yeah, that's all. I'm coming back for that. That, yes. Yes. It's good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> 1981, I think, was my first comic. Um, Captain America, issue 248. And it had Dragon Man versus Cap with John Bernard. And I have read that comic probably more than any other comic. And that is my uh, Jesus bat, or Adam West, Christ Savior, whatever you want to call it. And I have more. <laughs> if I could, I, heck, my wife made a, uh, a prenuptial agreement with me that uh, I could not get tattoos above the neckline. <laughs> and I want to eventually connect the bats from hand to foot so that I can tattoo out onto the hand so then I am unemployable. And that's my real goal because I don't really want to work in an office. <laughs> I'm now a much bigger baseball fan than I am a comic book fan. I could only spend money on one of the two things and baseball cards won out for a while and with very few comics I was buying. Um, and from that I, uh, I got into high school and then my grandfather passed and I know I used comics as a coping mechanism. They've always been an escapism for me, uh, as they should be for most people. And that's where like, my ideas for wanting a comic shop really started growing. I got a degree in political science and broadcast journalism, a double major, and went for five years into, uh, and was a TV news producer here in Des Moines. And what a soul-sucking, horrible, f***ing, horrible f***ing job that on the worst day of owning my shop, never once was it as bad as working one day in news. <laughs> a lot of people say, I've always wanted to own a comic book shop. Well, I really had. My grandmother passes away. Oh, this is a depressing story already. Um, she leaves some money, and I'm considering going away to Europe for a while. Um, I was just going to quit the job and go. I had this all planned out. I was ready to go. 
And then I get really drunk with a friend and landlord at the time. And we're lamenting the fact of why we don't like the comic shops. And every comic shop we've gone to, what's missing? There were some good ones. Mayhem in Ames was really, you would drive up to Ames to go to that shop. We were just getting really big coffee culture. And I said, you need something to drive people into a comic shop. We looked, we got a space, and we started growing coffee culture on the south side. Guys that might have a little bit more income, a little bit more education, a little bit more, um, how shall I say, uh, way with the girls, um, could bring their girlfriend with them when they went to the comic shop. Then a Starbucks opened uh, three years later, and our landlord happened to be uh, the guy behind it. Oh man, what a f***ing asshole. We saw our coffee business chopped in half. And our, it was like having your legs cut out from under you. We were finally doing great after three years. Uh, bills were current, everything was great. And it became a day in, day out trudge. Back to the, oh, <laughs> you wanna pay that one, that one, or that one? When you're a small business owner and you're in the highest tax bracket and you look at potentially as much as a third of your income, so in a quarter, your, a third of your money is going to taxes, um, Frankly, you get to the point where you're like, I love these people, and I did love my customers. F it. I can't live this way anymore. I wish when I was in Europe, before I opened the shop, I wish I had stayed. Um, if I could go back in time, I would, 12 years, if I could go back 13 years, I would stay. I would not have come back. So all of that would be gone. My wife knows this, by the way, so if she's watching. My business partners, I think could see it and they were like, you need to get out. So when the move came to move down here, I saw that as uh, mentally, uh, health-wise, uh, it had to happen. Kurt and Kyle, they have a passion for it. We really like coffee, we really like comic books. I still enjoy the idea of superheroes. Right. You know, that's my favorite medium. I'd rather read that than go to the movies or read a newspaper. Music's dead to me, so it's just my favorite thing to get my fiction and entertainment from. You just get uh, all walks of life with both of those things. Some people do coffee, some people do comics, right. some people do both. I mean, um, we have, you know, people that small, that young, to, you know, that old, to that tall that come in and enjoy either and or both. And I think what they have now uh, it's like a 1930s newsstand. It's what it always should have been. This is my idea done right. I, I, they, they, are, they are 10 times smarter on that end than I was. I don't have that mind. I don't have that thing. I might have come up with the stupid idea for a coffee shop, comic book shop. I know there's shops that have done this. We do obviously have a large variety of people who come here. We have coffee people, we have comic people. I let them choose the interaction for the most part. So if, you know, if they want to be chatty and talk with me while I make their coffee, or if they have some conflict they want to talk with me about and ask my opinion about, um, I totally will. But if they don't seem to, that's fine too. We'll go back to Batman 89, you know, so you're my number one, you know, that's... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Sarah is our number one. We couldn't do this. You without. ain't got no future. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Sarah. I don't even remember what the last question was. What they've gone back to is the origin, and they that they, they have changed some of the things and some of the styles of how they sell their comics too. It is a sprinkling. It is a newsstand. How they offer their comics. Um, you have to if you want to be a subscription customer, you have to prepay. So I try to stock that shelf as scarcely as I can for two reasons. So I don't lose money and I don't take all the risks. I've, they've helped me by helping them, the customers, sign up for things and they've already paid for it. Risk isn't on me anymore, but I saved them money, 20% best in town. With Cup of Crypt tonight, before they changed over to Cap Cape's Cafe, um, I was a loyal, I've pretty much been a loyal customer for like six months, maybe a year or so, before they changed over to Cape. Um, and when Cape's Cafe came into play, and I found out there were going to be tables for us to sit at to read our comic books while we drink our favorite coffee. 
I, uh, I would have to say I've been here since the very beginning. And we come up with drinks all the time and we're good at making it. And we got the Peter Porker comics. right now, bacon latte. Yep. Peter, Peter, Porker. Peter Porker. New drink every week. Let's see, last week we had Silver Surfer, white chocolate blueberry. Get ready to mocha. do the Zabaro shake next week. Zabaro shake is hot. That is the Spectre, which is uh, white chocolate and mint. Uh, oh, that's that's lovely. Frosted mint. It's delightful. Hey, there you go. Bacon latte. Yeah. Right. Well, hold on. Now, oh, you want a counterpart? Black suit variant. Now, the first one I got was the Ben Grimm, of course. I'm a big, I'm a big Thing fan. I love the Thing, and uh, I also love that Dreamsicle flavor. You know, uh, uh, oranges and cream. It's so good. It's so good. So good. And they had, uh, am I a little high on caffeine? Yes, I am. Like we do the dark side, and it's just 10 shots of espresso. Some poor kid, and dark side is a DC evil god. god of fear. Some poor evil. kid got it because he's a fan of Star Wars. We thought he was going to die. No, I'm sure he did. Like, he's <laughs> dead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll miss being with those two, though. I, I love those two. Uh, and I, I hope they, I wish them all the best. And I, I think they will have it. This location. This is the first downtown comic book shop the Moines ever had. And it is going to be the hub of young people in Des Moines. I refer to myself as a failed comic shop owner. And there is, you know what? There's a bit of pride I take with that. <laughs> I did what I most wanted to do. And so many people have dreams that they don't do. And they go through life regretting it. And that's how I look at it now, that though I failed, I did what I wanted to do, and I can be proud of that, that I, I did it. I might not have succeeded in doing it forever, but I got out, and a lot of comic shop people, a lot of people who own shops can't say that. You either do it and fail, and are bankrupt, which is what most people end up. <laughs> or you're in it, and you're in it forever. And you see those guys. Those are the really old guys with the, the shops that have stacks of comics that they've never sorted because the industry just eats at you. I am glad I tried and failed, even though some would say you didn't fail. Um, and I also wish I hadn't done it. <laughs> I love you, honey. <laughs>
And when I have a problem with Diamond, it's Diamond versus little tiny comic shop. When uh, the giant Midtown Comics in, in, in New York has a problem, oh, what do you need? I don't know anyone personally, but I've heard people are like, super down on diamond and pissed off they're doing this to us and doing that to us i don't i don't see it they're they're doing business we're doing business they they're doing business according to the terms we've all agreed to that's the only part is we're doing business in the terms that we've all agreed to but since you didn't have a choice of another distributor you kind of had to agree to those terms but they're not bad terms but you know, we just got back from a retailer meeting in Las Vegas, and that was really cool. They don't have to do that. You know, they don't have to bring in all these publishers for us to talk face to face to, but they do. So I mean, they do good things as well, um, but they are kind of seen as the evil empire. The things they do well, they do extremely well. Let's ship every week. 2,600 different accounts and make sure everybody gets their stuff on time and make sure everybody gets what they ordered. Wow, you want that job? Because I don't. I wish one thing they would do, I wish they do the, I wish everybody would do what DC does and that a lot of their books are returnable. Image, though, has said we will allow you to return these books of these new book, these new number ones if you order over a certain threshold. But Diamond doesn't allow that through Marvel and DC because Marvel and DC want you to order 30 extra and be stuck with them. Um, when you see a Marvel second print, most of the time that's horrible. Um, there are enough of those copies out there. <laughs> Literally everything in a bookstore except a coffee shop is returnable. Like at a Barnes & Noble. The, Barnes & Noble is really just a consignment store for publishers. But their return on that stuff is terrible. I couldn't live on it. I can't live on 20%. Because I'm ordering, I know what I'm doing enough now. I'm not going to sell triple the amount of books to make up the difference by having more. I mean, I, if I sell out of a book, I get it back immediately. We would probably get a 35% discount as opposed to, say, a 50 or plus. It would have to be cut down. It would have to. Um, because but, but, and the big but, yeah, the big but, is everybody takes risk then, not just the shop. And I don't even want to return a bill because it's a pain in the ass. I don't want to strip those covers and send them back and track this and track that. Plus, if the post office loses one of those packages, you, all the credit that you've earned on all those issues the whole year is probably down the toilet. Just print enough that if it sells out, I can call and get more. When you go into a shop and you see an old wall, what that is, and you see old books, that is comics that were bought, weren't sold, and they ate. And I'll tell you what, comics don't taste very good. And I've contemplated eating. My favorite thing about this place is this. Yeah, this is really pretty neat. I, I've never seen. That's a really, that's a really cool way to use your slap walls. I've never seen anybody do that, and it just makes so much sense. I don't remember my first comic. I know it was Spider-Man. Um, basically, I had a stepbrother for a while, and he kind of got me. We were both the same age, 13. And he got me into comics. We'd kind of go up to the local little gas station and read them. I actually got the first, you know, Amazing Spider-Man number one. Of all the stuff that I do collect, that's the main one that I'm focusing on. And I'm down to about four issues now. Because the original store was a lot smaller than this. I moved over to this location probably about eight years ago, nine years ago. And I put up slot wall, got nice looking cabinets, um, did the back issues, did the graphic novels. So I think, it, I think everything looks pretty good right now. Um, I mean, there's always room for improvement, but I'm pretty happy with the way the store looks. My old location was in the middle of a residential area. There was a lot of antique shops there and stuff, but the building looked like a house. 
I wasn't doing the sales that I wanted to, and you know, so I took the chance of a higher rent and bigger space and moved up here, and it's been great. I think there's three main keys for me. Um, it's the back issues, the graphic novels, and the new books. They're probably split pretty evenly. It's the only comic book store that I know that, like, just does comics, so I figured hey, if I might as well come to the place where that's its specialty, you know? It's very welcoming, I think. It's not It's not necessarily that it's it's a business where it's like, okay, here's, you know, we have it lined up where you walk in the door and, like, you have, like, you're directed this way to get your stuff and it's directed back to the cash register. It's not like that, which I've seen some shops like that. You walk in and you almost feel there's an aisle that you have to walk through to go, like, oh, here's your book. Pick up the book. And as you're on this conveyor belt, like, oh, yeah, here's your bag. Get your bag. And, oh, here's a new issue. Get your base new. And then you stop at the register. It's like, oh, wow, how did I even end up here? I'm not into gaming and stuff like that, so I, I don't know nothing about it. You know, so I'm not going to get into something that I don't know anything about. So I decided to make it strictly a, you know, comic book store. A lot of people appreciate that. You know, they don't appreciate, you know, having half the store full of teenagers or adults screaming and yelling over tables, you know, playing games and stuff. They, they want to come into a comic shop and browse without the distraction. And I have a lot of people that they get their pull and hold at a different shop, which I don't understand, but that's that's another thing. But they, you know, they come here to get all their back issues. You know, there's other stores that have a decent sized collection of back issues, but they're not organized. And I think that's a key factor. One of the problems with a lot, a lot of uh, comic book stores is that their back issues are just a bunch of beat up boxes on the floor. That inspires people to go somewhere else where it's not so hard to look for. That inspires, inspires people to go to the internets. You have Wolverine number one, and I think they've relaunched it three times in the last two years. So and they haven't given it a different name, it's just Wolverine. So how, is, how do you do that with your back issue system? The goal is to sell out of your new issues. That doesn't happen. So you got to put them new issues somewhere and the back issue is a logical place. So the people that are phasing out back issues, I don't understand where they're putting these comics. We have a really nice collection of, of trays and hardcovers and we even have busts and you know, figures and stuff, but it's still strictly comic. You know, and that's why I really love about it is like just the dedication strictly to, to this industry and to this passion. I mean, this is this is you know part of our history, in my opinion. People say our mega history is, you know, baseball, but I, people think of Superman first, in my opinion. I ran into Superman and he died. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have a very good constitution. Strange for a guy who embodies the American way. <laughs> Best part is probably. When people come in and tell me that um, I got the best store that they've ever seen, that's probably, you know, that just really pumps you up right then and there. So that's probably, yeah. We'll see you. Thanks, man. Later. Thank you. Crush it, man. Well, that was fun. Yeah. People who go do the digital are new people, they're not people that do comics already. Because most subscriber or most regular customers, they want the print. They want it in their hand. The numbers over the last few years have shown that digital doesn't pull readers away from brick and mortar comic stores. Because you've seen digital comic numbers, you know, going up and up every single year. At the same time, you've seen, you know, print comic book sales going up. So clearly, they're reaching different audiences. I like having the, the comic in my hand, uh, turning the pages, reading it right there. And also it's because, you know, it gives me an excuse to get out of the house, you know. I, I really hope that we don't lose the brick and mortar comic book store because it's not just about the comics, even though I, for me, it, it, I want to be able to hold them in my hand, it really is about the environment, it's about the people. I was really worried about digital when it first started getting really prominent when they were going to do day and date. I got really worried that people were going to do it. And then my wife finally convinced me. She's like, so you think all those people that get in their car, drive in traffic, get over into your shopping center that's not that easy to get in or out of, park there, come in, hang out for 30 minutes, BS, know your birthday, give you, you know, sympathy cards when your dog died, 
You know, you think those people are looking to not do that. They really wish they could come there twice a week. Have we lost some to digital? I suspect we have. Hard to quantify, hard to see. More often we lose people as a subscriber or a regular customer here to some economic force. People still want a collectible. Digital comics aren't collectible. They're purely entertainment. You rented it. I think it's weird that you would call it a comic book because I call it a photograph of a hamburger a hamburger. It's not a digital hamburger, it's a picture of a hamburger. You paid three dollars for the same thing I paid three dollars for. I got to keep mine. Yours is just air. I can read it, I can get the digital copy, I can take digital copy with me on vacation and read it again. And never have to worry about my comic getting damaged. Oh god, it's great for collectors. That's what it is. <laughs> if you're just a little OCD like me, yeah. And I guess digital is really big overseas in other countries where they don't have, they literally do not have access to American comics. So that's good. It's a gateway for people to find out about what is the more prominent thing right now, which is print comics. That hasn't been pushed out of favor yet, right? Uh, give us 10 years and um, more ubiquitous, you know, pads in everybody's hands that are, you know, just as gorgeous and that you can do splash pages with and that have all the dynamic notation that should probably exist in a digital version of comics. Give us a few years and you'll, it might be different. Now to be sure, if that changes, it will change damn quickly. It will literally go like this overnight. It's been a decade or more since people have started to say, oh, comics are going to go obsolete. Mm -hmm. uh, two to three years, they're going to be gone. They're not going to be gone. The stores have to evolve, yes. The comics, it, it's not going to go away. The people still want the book in their hand. They want to take it to their artist or writer and have them sign it. It's not a lot of fun bringing a computer and have your, your favorite artist or Stan Lee or somebody sign because what are you going to do with it after it conks out on you? We have a different feel and a different affect. I mean, the destruction of the bookstores in America was frightening to watch. I mean, it was just, wow, bookstore that's been in business for 70 years went out of business in two months. I don't know what our secret is. I think we can embrace it and really, really make it rock, especially stuff like Marvel doing that. Even DC, if DC would go through and offer it free with their books, I think DC would see sales increase. So. I'm not scared of the digital age, bring it on. Like Love Garden Sounds, which is a record shop here in town, and, and record shops in general, I think that comic shops will probably become that, which is you'll have a few monthly titles, you'll have a bunch of indie stuff, and then you'll have just graphic novels and trade paperbacks, really, for the most part. I mean, I don't know how else you would, you're not gonna have people coming to you and wanting to buy the digital download cards I mean, it defeats the purpose. That didn't work at bookstores when they tried to do that. You have to kill off the last guy. And we've got 40 years. In in 100 years, I don't know. Say all the people buying comics now are the last generation to buy them. We'll all die together. I'll be dead, you'll be dead, they'll all be dead, and the children of the corn can read their books on their giant Fahrenheit 451 TVs, but I'll be dead, so I don't care. I became a comic book reader as young as I can remember, about as early as I, I could start reading. I was reading comics. Uh, the, my first big passion was Calvin and Hobbes. I actually ended up writing my college thesis on Cal Calvin and Hobbes. It's a friendly way to jump into comics. A lot of comic strips are family friendly and there's not a lot of violence. There's, you know, a lot of parents are more comfortable with them getting involved through all ages comics and a lot of parents that didn't read comics grew up with comic strips. Yeah, yeah, that too. Star Clipper has been open for 26 years, 10 of which we've been in our current location. We've had four previous locations, all in the U City area. So it's uh, Ben and AJ Trujillo, our, our owners, 
and uh, they're a married couple, they own the store, and Ben is responsible for designing a point of sale system called Moby, which we sell to other comic shops throughout the country. So it's like competing software with Diamond Suite. The space was really nice when we moved in. That was one of the interest, one of the reasons why we were interested in, uh, you know, coming to this space. Mm -hmm. Is the place was so nice. But like for instance, our owner put up these chandeliers, which makes this kind of like the Ritz Carlton of comic shops. <laughs> I believe in '98 or '99, Star Clipper won an Eisner Award. That was at our former location. Uh, which is uh, about 10 minutes away from our current location. Uh, once you win an Eisner Award, you can only win it once. So I think in all the changes we've made, we've even improved and are more deserving to win an Eisner now, but uh, you can only win it once. So, But it's a great award to have. Um, we get a lot of good buzz from being in, we're the only Eisner Award winning comic shop in the St. Louis region. I graduated uh, from business and film school. I had a, two majors and uh, they were hiring. I took the job just to get something out of something like directly after school and ended up becoming the manager of the store. It's great. I get to sell my hobby and make a living off my childhood hobby. I think there's every there's something for everyone here. There you know? definitely is. The breadth of, of uh, different genres and different types is uh, has really blown up, uh, so it's not just uh, cheesy superhero kind of things anymore. It's it's really like a, a literary art form. Uh, our primary focus is on trades over comics. We consider our store more of a reader's market than a collector's market. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of advantages I think in reading the trades than over reading comics. Uh, you know, you can fit them on your bookshelf. They don't have any advertisements. You don't have to put them in a box, like a comic box. Uh, they're easier to lend out to people because you don't have to lend out five individual items. You can just give them the whole story. Somebody can come in and be like, I want to read Civil War. If you don't have it in stock, you're sold out, you can order it from the distributor. If you have somebody in comes in and goes, I want to read the first issue of Civil War, but I want a single issue, it's a total luck of the draw. If you have it waiting in a back issue box, then you can sell it. Otherwise, you're out of luck. I need this book. <laughs> I, I need it. And I love being able to go to a back issue store or go to a convention and look for back issues. That's kind of the, the thrill of the hunt. Um, so I'm not dismissing it at all, but if you want to be smart in opening a new store, you really have to think, what can I do to to make sure I can serve our customers. This summer and last summer we did a, a program called Comics University where we did, uh, this year we did eight weeks, the first year we did 12 weeks of free programming. Um, so we had an instructor for each Wednesday night would come in and teach a different course about comics. So it could be like religion and comics. It could be a figure drawing course. It could be uh, the history of Superman. We really try to educate our customers about the history of comics and the relevance of why we read them. We also do a ladies night every year so um, one of our big missions is to try to break the stereotype that I, when I was a kid it was kind of thought of as more of a, a male centric hobby um, and we really try to break that stereotype and make it accessible to everybody to come in and enjoy comics. Kids can read and draw their own comics actually on our table right here, which is kind of fun. The way to grow the industry is to attract younger readers. I feel like I'm selling cigarettes or something, but you know, that's, that's what you gotta do. You gotta cultivate a, a new young audience. But when we have a kid come in who's made a comic and we tell them, well, of course we'll sell your comic for you. Even if they get 50 cents for it, it is like a, one of their biggest thrills, you know, is in their young life. Champions of Erinville was created by two 13-year-old uh, sisters. And wow. The art's pretty solid. You know, for their first time. Not bad. We hosted a signing for them and everything. Oh, cool. They had a great time. And you know what a confidence builder, too. You're going to get more people 
off the street who are familiar with your mainstream, like Guardians of the Galaxy is a huge hit, so you're gonna have people come in for that. We've got a True Blood sign in the window, so you're gonna have people come in for that. Those are like kind of bigger than just, you know, the small press books that we also are really good at selling. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that attracts people is that this looks like a regular store. It doesn't look like a comic book store. Um, you know, we've got the hardwood floors and the high ceilings and the non-fluorescent lighting. If you present it that and it's accessible and people feel like it's a clean shop and they are comfortable coming around and shopping, you're more likely to attract new readers um, and not readers who are just familiar with, you know, the your stereotypical comic shops. I don't know. As long as there's kids in the world, there's probably going to be popular superheroes. We've had superheroes since the dawn of time. I mean, Hercules, uh, Achilles, uh, all the, the Greek and Roman legends, that, those are superheroes. I think it's kind of rooted in the American experience, really. And we seem to have, like, I mean, it, it existed almost in semi-obscurity as a, as a subculture for years and years that kind of you know, would bubble to the surface via pop culture. But now that you have movies and TV shows and it's just like legitimized the whole thing, I, I think that, you know, it's, the idea of the superheroes not being a thing is kind of over now. I mean, you see non-comic people getting Captain America's shield tattoos or bat symbols or stuff like that. The superhero niche, it's not going to go anywhere. You know, they change, they put their underwear on the inside now, but, you know, it's, it's still going to... I think superheroes will still be popular. People, I mean, it will fizzle out in movies. Eventually, they'll burn it up. But people act like, oh, this is the end of it. You're like, you know, they made like 10,000 cowboy movies for 60 years before people went, I'm done with cowboy movies. And they still make some. You know, once a year they make a cowboy movie. But they made a gazillion cowboy movies before they had to stop making them. I think we're way early before we're going to be done with superhero movies. Gee, I don't know. Do you know who Thor is? Do you know who Hercules is? Oh, okay, how old are they? Next question. Are we there yet? And now with it. Are we there yet? Yes, we okay. are. Get out. He's faster than the internet and stronger than the tide. He's smarter than a think tank and he's on the righteous side. He's super lightning, wild dude. He's a hero bone of pie. He'll jump over the buildings and he'll race a bullet train. He'll pulverize a mountain. Ready? Here's a side. <laughs> Bottom, top, other side. That's cool. Oh, oh, that's cool. I, oh man, I, oh. General Zod. Oh man. I would say it's a pop culture store, but it is, it is like a comic book store. Most everything here is comic book. Movie. Although they do have some Elvis and James Dean, which is a peculiar thing to include, but whatever. I am, I'm liking it, and I'm gonna get it. to uh, show everybody your store. Your, this is it. Your fantabulous store. This is it. Well, I read it when I was a little kid. I don't remember what what the issue number was. It was an Incredible Hulk, Hulk versus Abomination. That was, I think, my first comic. I didn't read them as an adult. I didn't read them when I bought the store. I had, uh, I was in the arcade game business, and I had arcade games in the store in Lee Summit. And in bringing them in, it had been like, you know, 10 years or more since I'd seen a comic. 
and then in that time like Image and all the new new Marvel and new DC stuff had come out so when I saw them I was like wow these are awesome this is way cooler than I was a kid so then I started getting comics then this is my best year ever I think it's way better time to have a comic shop than it's ever been because it's just way more mainstream way more people are into it way more people are casually into it we try and just make it all fun we have a party every Wednesday we have six or eight big events every year where we have artists and writers and DJs and food trucks and making an actual party pizza it used to just be beer and soda or one pizza and soda now it's just pizza and beer it makes me tolerate the whole day much better every Wednesday night you have a group of people come hang out, drink beer, eat pizza, talk comics, uh, but it's not, a, you know, a, 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 a secret clubhouse. Like anybody's welcome to come in and hang out. People come in honestly, sometimes just listen to us talk about everything, and it's sometimes it's really uh, funny. So, and the conversations itself just gets out of hand sometimes. Why is it called a leaf? Because uh, that's a $2,000 sign that was already here. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, now, I probably wouldn't have picked that name. Now, do you like the name? Well, or you just, now. You're married to it now? Yeah, I'm married so to it. I think there's a lot of comic shops that have a... They want it to be more like a secret society. Where when people come in and like, I don't know anything about comics, what should I read? They, like, dismiss them. Anybody can order a lot of product and you can have a lot of books on the shelves and you can have a lot of different stuff available. That's cool, but really it's about the attitude and the atmosphere and the environment of the shop. And so that's what this shop has in spades. It's, a, you know, I, I, even if I wasn't buying comics, I'd want to come here just to hang out. It's that kind of shop. My namesake has been killed in several of Jason Aaron's comics. No, no. Very often in a super violent death. Everyone's just, you know, Welcome to come in and hang out and BS, and we're always playing, you know, classic action sci-fi movies on the TV, and people, it's like an old-fashioned barbershop or a bar. When we did the the guys that started um, Free Comic Book Day, started, they're like, there's a comic book for everybody in the world. I'm like, no, there's not. Half the people in America read nothing. If I brought comics to their house for free and delivered it to their hand, they'd go, there's not a comic for everybody. I'm not. I don't. I'm not trying to convert anybody. It's not a religion. I don't. I'm not trying to like draw people in that don't want to read comics. I'm like, we got a ton of comics. Practically every comic that's made any main by any mainstream publisher, we got it. And if we don't have it, we can get it. And I got a lot of cool collectibles that would be cool in your house. If you want them, I'll sell them to you. Otherwise, that's okay. I don't. I don't need to force you to read a comic book. The people that come to a comic book store, I like those people. Most of those people, uh, not all of them, there's some, you know, really conservative people. Most of them, pretty liberal. Most of them have the same kind of ideas I have. And you know, I think liberal, conservative, whoever, you know I can get along with comic people, they're readers. People who read are people I can get along with. People who get all their information from television, we're probably not going to get along. It's fun. I like to make deals. Come, someone's going to come in and buy a bunch of back issues. Let's keep going. Keep stacking up. Let's make a deal. Let's make a discount. Buy, pick a stack up. One of my favorite things ever is a guy who will like buy a bunch of stuff and he'll be like, oh, I'm short. I'm like, let me see your wallet. What do you have? He shows me all his cash. I'm like, hey, we got, this says 90 bucks. You got 81 cash. I'll take it as long as that's all your money. If you're willing to give me all the cash out of your wallet, we can make a deal. But they want to come in. We got the Life Size Simpsons. We got the Life Size Silver Surfer. We got art all over the walls. We got our graveyard of open toys. We got statues you can't see anywhere else, hot toys. I mean, I've had other store owners come in here and think I'm insane because I've got so many statues and hot toys in here that, you know, they're like, I just, I'd want to turn this stuff over in a second. I couldn't have, you know, that much, that many dollars for the stuff on display, but you got to make it worth the trip. I mean, they can buy the shit on the internet. I don't know if this is true anywhere else, but I know in Kansas City, no one will consider you a legitimate store without back issues. Since we've had the store, there's probably been, in South Overland Park and Olathe, I bet there's been 20 stores open and closed. And I've heard people say, they didn't even have back issues. It's not even a, it's not even a comic shop, they didn't have back issues. I think it's proven that you can just predominantly sell comics and comic-related merchandise and thrive. 
I'm always here. I don't hire people to work in the store so I can sit in the office and do whatever. I don't know what a guy who owns a comic shop is spending 40 hours a week in an office for. If you're going to spend 40 hours a week in an office, go get an office job. You won't have to worry about anything. You get your paycheck on Friday, you're done. But I know lots of guys. I see on like on the Diamond website, they every day have a little profile of a comic shop. They'll show a comic shop that's this size or smaller. And they'll say, here's the owner, here's the manager, here's the assistant manager, and it says they've got five employees. I'm like, it takes you eight people to run a 1,000 square foot comic book store. What are you doing? What is wrong? It doesn't take eight people to run that store. It takes eight people to run that store if the guy who owns it doesn't want to work there. The guy who manages it sees him as he sees himself as a guy who manages people, not sells comics. The assistant manager for well, I just do the ordering. And then they got five people selling comic books. And people come in here, I mean five days a week, I'm right back there. You want to come in and talk to me? I'm here. And I know all the, I mean, I don't know all these guys, but I know almost all these guys for a long time. It's almost a community that he's kind of developing, which I haven't been to a lot of other stores in the last several years, but, you know, from earlier experiences, it's vastly different. And from what I hear, it's different from a lot of stores still. You should let him hey, what's up? I don't know why people don't like it. People do like it now, but people used to think I was angry because I just answered the phone, Elite. And like, oh, uh, do you guys have comics? I'm like, yeah, it's a comic shop. Come on in. And I think it's just because I don't like to talk on the phone. I like to talk in person. Come in. You can chat all day long. Look through the back issues. Find whatever you want. Do whatever you want. The phone to me is like a field radio. Call in the bombing coordinates, get off the line. I don't want chit chat. And I'm not like gruff on the phone. I'll, I'm nice to people on the phone. I just, to me, it sounds really weird when people have like a fake, like, welcome to Joe's Comics, where everything's half off on this day. Have you heard about the new Spider Man movie? That makes me want to throw up. Where someone has a little card they're reading of like, and corporates told them, if the, if the assistant to the assistant, manager of this district calls up and you aren't reading off that card no gold star no i'm just telling you you elite i'm here that you've reached elite comics best part is the people no the best part is that i get to bring my dogs to work with me the second best part is the people hardest part what do you hate uh i don't know i'm not super big on vacuuming and I think I might be the only person that's ever done it here because I have a really hard time telling other people to do it when I don't do it. And I kind of don't like it. I don't like it so much I think I killed the vacuum yesterday. Comic book run. Um, because... I want the comics to be a good run for each each line, but also have them run into the comics bookstore to, to want to buy them. So comic book run. If you focus on that, if you could call it full run comics. Full run comics would be a good one too, yeah. Comic strip, if you pay a certain amount, we have a back room. I'm sure the name will kind of allude to what that does. So yeah, there you go. That's an interesting combination. I think that that will drum up a lot of business. I'd probably have to call it something like critical hits, uh, because it, it, there's you get a little bit of a, a little bit of you know double entendre meeting there for both your comic book creators and for your uh, for your game players as well. So. Fat shop. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just making up. Some, I don't know. I really don't know. Fat shop comics. Fat shop comics. I would call that store Earth Prime. The cave. The cave. Yeah, you know, it's like give 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 a little nod to the Dark Knight. I would probably call it something like Holy Roman Empire comics or something like that. <laughs> New beginnings. Today's insane comic book store. With extra meat. Don't open a comic book shop. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't do it. A lot of people think this is easy. Just open that box, set those comics on the shelf and let the money roll in. Well, it's not really that easy. Um, I'd, you know, I'd suggest go, go work in a comic store for a little while, try it out, 
see if it's even something you would like to do. Make sure you have plenty of money. It's hard to get into, into the business, and especially, especially if you're near another shop. The rent will be one thing that's constant. It'll always go up, it'll never go down, and it'll always eat you out of house and home because it's the biggest expenditure next to buying product. But you control that, but rent you can't control. Make sure you have enough money saved to live for two years. Find some place where there's not already a bunch of stores. Like that's the weirdest thing everybody does. Instead of saying, I'm gonna to go to this place that is underserved and open a store and get new customers, they want to go somewhere and steal customers. Location, location, location. It's gotta be a business first. If it's between me getting a copy of Amazing Spider-Man number one and a customer getting a copy of Amazing Spider-Man number one, the customer is gonna get it. I think it's possible to be too into it, where you can't ever let go of anything good and you have to tell people that that book's not good or it used to be better and you have to give them your critical opinion about Fantastic Four is not like when Jack Kirby did it, it's not nearly as good and I can't really sell you that thing because I don't have one in my personal collection. You can get too wrapped up in the product. Never get high on your own supply, I believe in that. And you got, that's why you gotta be open to everything. There's no series out there that you can dislike or hate or anything like that. You've gotta be open to everything as a comic person, as a comic seller. Because uh, you gotta know what people are after. There's just so many personalities and what they're after and everything. You have to be so dedicated. You have to know that you're working 60 to 80 hours a week. You have to know that when you go home, after working 10 to 12 hours, during that day. And if you own something that's weird, like a coffee shop, comic book shop, that means you're opening at the butt crack of dawn to sell coffee. Then you're selling comics in the afternoon and evening and selling coffee. If you're working that whole shift, you still have to go home and finish that weekly order. Then the other mistake people make is that they are in their store. And they're an asshole. And people don't like them. They should hire someone to work in their store. But most people, you gotta put your thumbprint on the thing or there's, there's what is it? Just a bunch of stuff. Now that I've seen some of these places, I would hate to have gone through life and not seen the comic shop that was also a barber shop. Yeah. But, but on top of a, a place as massive as the source. Yeah. You know. And that's the thing I've gotten most out of this is good lord, I knew there was a culture, but I didn't know it was like this. Like I, I went I went in search of it, thinking I knew what it was so much more than I, than, I, than I ever thought. And we're just looking at the Midwest. Julie Schwartz back in the day, over the years I kind of became friends with him. And uh, we used to talk on the phone religiously and he'd say, Minnesota and Wisconsin, Iowa, and that belt straight down, those were the reports they were the most interested in for sales reports. Because if they were, excuse me, if they were going there, they knew they had a hit. Coasts weren't sending the trend, the mighty Midwest was. As far as the community, people would be very sad if the store was not here. Will the world go on if the store was not here? Yes, it would. Would it be as fun? No. I couldn't wear a Superman t-shirt to school without the threat of getting beaten up when I was a kid. Now everybody can. We are the new plan. Innocent with a grin you can see from space Couldn't have been any older than five When the class got our very first homework assignment And what do you want to be when you grow up? I was fine till the other kids showed up With doctors and astronauts Even people cleaning out the trash can Not me, I wanted to be Batman But that plan didn't seem quite so brilliant I changed it to be like those children It seemed like the right thing to do But now I don't even remember what I changed it to Just that even then I thought that it was lame Twenty years later and it's not what I became I wish I would have let them vote I was a weirdo Cause I still want to be a hero when it goes like this I'm gonna do what I want I will never put anything but the truth in a song I choose the route that my future is on And I don't care if I'm doing it wrong You can do what you want Eventually you'll get to where you truly belong Where the ugly duck grew into a beautiful swan And who cares if you're doing it wrong 
Grown man with a dream to chase And a chip on the shoulder you can see from space Every day they keep raising the stakes So no more playing it safe I spent a lifetime trying to be a regular guy But there's already an endless supply If you ever put your head to the sky And dreamt you can fly Then you know you're expected to set it aside and forget it Cause it'll never lead you on a safe path I really did quit my job to make rap And I'm terrified Not as much as I would have been Sitting in the same place Wondering what could have been If it works, it's cause I'm good at it I'm good at it cause I put in the work And I got no regrets no matter the outcome Loving it's just one of the perks And it goes like this I'm gonna do what I want I will never put anything but the truth in a song I choose the route that my future is on And I don't care if I'm doing it wrong You can do what you want Eventually you'll get to where you truly belong Where the ugly duck grew into a beautiful swan And who cares if you're doing it wrong Do what you love, do it because you love it Do it cause if you don't then you feel it in your stomach Do it cause if you don't then you feel like you're being punished Even if you never see a cent from it Do it for the feeling of doing it like nobody's ever done it Singing it from the mountains, the yodel it from the summit Shout about it louder than blowing on heaven Shrubbing with the speakers of over 1100 and it goes like this I'm gonna do what I want I will never put anything but the truth in a song I choose the route that my future is on And I don't care if I'm doing it wrong you can do what you want, eventually you'll get to where you truly belong With the ugly duck grew into a beautiful swan And who cares if you're doing it wrong? Say, who cares if you're doing it wrong? 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 I don't care if I'm doing it wrong, y'all. Thank you.